When it comes to Martin Brundle, we all remember his legendary and infamous moments as the voice of Formula One. Moments like these. Oh yes! Oh, out goes, I don't think out goes Michael Schumacher. That didn't work. That didn't work, Michael. You hit the wrong part of him, my friend. I don't think that will cause Villeneuve a problem. Also, moments like these. Kimmy, you missed the presentation by Pele. Yeah. Will you get over it? <laughs> yeah, I was having a shit. <laughs> Obviously, you'll have a nice light car on the grid then. This moment is actually my personal favourite. Shame you're too old to have driven here, really. I am too old to have driven here, but... Uh, you would have liked it. Yeah. Shame you wasn't fast enough to get to Formula One. Oh, and also this one as well. You're a freestyle rapper. Have you got any rap for us today on Formula One? Okay, okay. Maybe it's actually better to forget that one. Anyway, everyone knows Martin Brundle the pundit, but what about Martin Brundle, the driver? How good was he in Formula One? What's remarkable about Martin's career is that the guy won races and championships across so many different racing categories. In Formula One, he notched up just nine podiums in 158 starts, but that doesn't tell anywhere near the full story because outside of Formula 1, he finished second in British Formula 3, he won a world championship in sports cars, he is a winner of the Daytona 24 hour, and he is also a Le Mans 24 hour winner as well. The man's passion for racing rivals that of anyone. Even to this day in his work with Sky F1, he tries to drive at least one Formula 1 car a year for a pre-race segment. And on top of that, he still races on the odd occasion, now having raced for over 40 years. Martin from an early age had immense driving ability, but it was in the 1983 British Formula 3 season where he really made his name. That year, across 20 races, one race was won by a man called Calvin Fish, seven races were won by Martin Brundle, and the remaining 12 races were won by some guy called Ayrton Senna. That year, Senna and Brundle fought it out for the title, and even though Ayrton had the race wins, Martin had the consistency. Martin finished on the podium in every single race that season, and lost out on the title in the final race. Now, Senna that year won nine races in a row, and we all know what he went on to become, so that should tell you immediately how much talent Martin had as a young driver. Eventually, of course, for the following season, both Brundle and Senna would make it into Formula 1. Martin made his debut for the Tyrrell team, but his rookie season would be one of the most extraordinary seasons that would not just define the rest of his career, but also his life. His rookie season would be defined by two incredible highs and two very, very scary lows. The high points were scoring points on his Grand Prix debut in Brazil, finishing fifth, and keep in mind that this is when points were only given out to the top six. However, there was an even bigger highlight when in the Detroit Grand Prix, he would finish second claiming his first podium in just his eighth race in Formula 1. Now, both of those results, unfortunately, would be stricken off Martin's record as Tyrrell at the end of 1984 were disqualified. To make a long story short, Tyrrell had found a very clever way to run their cars under weight during the races, and then before the end of the race and before the cars needed to be weighed, they would pit and fill a tank with lead-infused water, which then brought them back up to the minimum weight. This, however, was illegal and the team were rightly disqualified from the 1984 World Championship. His season would really be remembered, however, by two big crashes. During qualifying in Monaco coming into Tabac, he had a massive shunt flipping the car and actually hitting his helmet into the barrier. Martin famously ran back to the pits, jumping into the spare car, seemingly totally fine and ready to finish qualifying. However, when team boss Ken Tyrrell came up to check on him, Martin asked him, which circuit am I at? Because he didn't know whether to turn left or right at the end of the pit lane. Ken Tyrrell, realizing that Martin still had a concussion, 
reached into the cockpit and shut the engine off there and then. However, it was Dallas 1984 that would be the crash that would alter Martin's career and change his life forever. In practice, after a puncture, he crashed head-on into a solid concrete barrier which sent his car rolling. There's no footage of the crash that I could find except for one picture of the car afterwards. In the crash, he broke both of his ankles and feet. And in the hospital, the doctors almost decided to amputate his left foot. Martin recalling the crash years later said that when he looked down, the only thing that was keeping his foot attached to his body was his skin. Martin was lucky not to die in that crash. We're so accustomed to seeing spectacular crashes in modern F1, where the drivers are able to walk away totally fine and just shake it off. This was not one of those crashes. He was out for the remainder of the season, and although it's difficult to prove, many people even to this day believe that Martin was never the same driver. That exciting rookie that scored points and a podium, he did not come back after that Dallas 84 crash. Even to this day, Martin has said that he still walks with a limp because he still carries those injuries from breaking both of his feet and almost losing his legs. It's really sad to think about what a Martin Brundle who never had that crash could have achieved. The next seven years in Formula 1 would be messy. The Tyrrell was never a good enough car to really break into the midfield and by 1986, Martin was looking for a way out. For 87, however, his options were almost non-existent, and he ended up at Zack Speed. Now, quite how he ended up racing for them, I do not know, because if Tyrrell had struggled to get into the midfield, Zack Speed were playing backmarkers. When talking about his one season with them, he described them as the dreaded Zack Speed, which I think tells you everything you need to know. Even so, Martin still pulled out some amazing results, at the 1987 San Marino Grand Prix in Imola, he qualified 16th and then went on to finish in 5th scoring points. In Zach Speed's 5 seasons in Formula 1, that was the only time the team ever scored points, and it's not an accident that it was Brundle to do it. By this point, however, Martin had become disillusioned with Formula 1. In the 4 years between 1988 and 1991, he took two seasons out in 88 and 90, and in between those seasons in 89 and 91, he raced with the declining Brabham team. Martin was in and out of Formula 1 because, as much as he loved it, the cars he had were never good enough to really achieve anything. But outside of Formula 1, this was the richest period of success for him in his entire racing career. In the three years from 88 to 90, this is where he won the World Sports Car Championship and the Daytona 24 Hour in the same year, and then the Le Mans 24 Hour in 1990. For Martin, it was a never ending mental battle of feeling like he's driving at his absolute best and winning so much outside of F1, but then never having cars to prove how good he was in F1. However, it was staying in sports cars which then directly led him to the best F1 car he ever drove. In the 1991 430km of Silverstone Endurance Race, Martin would produce quite literally the drive of his life that changed his career. In his own words, he said, At Silverstone, my throttle cable broke after just two laps and it took ages to fix. So, rather than compromise Derek's or Teo's points position, they left me in the car to do the whole race, single-handed, flat out. I took five laps out of the Mercs, three laps out of the Peugeots, and two laps out of my teammates, and put it on the podium, got third place. At the end, I was so knackered, I just sat in the car and couldn't stop crying. Tom and Ross were just getting involved in the Benetton F1 team then, and that drive led directly to my Benetton seat alongside Schumacher in 1992. The one season he had at Benetton really was the one year where he actually had a decent car. The B192 was a front-running car, although in classic Brundle style, this was also the season with one of the most dominant F1 cars of all time at the front, 
with the Williams FW14B. This meant that theoretically, every race should be a 1-2 for Williams, and as far as the other podium place, well, he had Schumacher alongside him and Senna to also contend with. Now, whilst he himself admits that the first four races were a disaster as he put too much pressure on his shoulders, in the remaining 12 races, he relaxed, and from here on, the real Martin Brundle was unleashed. In 12 races, he scored points 11 times, finishing on the podium 5 times which included a career best, second place in Monza. Now, remember I said that his first podium in his rookie season was technically taken away? That meant that the first time he officially stood on the F1 podium at the 1992 French Grand Prix was 8 years after he had stood on the second step in Detroit. Now, when it comes to that, scoring points in 11 out of the last 12 races, the one race mid-season that he didn't score points in was Canada. Canada 1992 was the Grand Prix win that got away. In a race where the two Williams and Senna retired, Brundle overtook Schumacher and was running P2, chasing down Gerhard Berger who was leading. Although Martin was catching Berger and had the pace to win the race, he would retire late on with a gearbox issue. That was the race and that was the opportunity to become a Grand Prix winner in his narrow year of opportunity. Because even when it came to Michael Schumacher, he himself only won one Grand Prix in 1992. And Martin still thinks and talks about Canada 92 to this day. For 1993, he was out. Up against Schumacher, he had done more than a good enough job, but in Martin's own words, the Italian team with an Italian team principal wanted an Italian driver, and so he was replaced by Riccardo Patrese. The rest of the 90s would see Martin in decent cars, but nothing like the Benetton ever again. Even though he didn't have that raw, exciting speed of a young driver, by the 90s, it was his experience, ability in the races, and better reliability of the cars in the 90s compared with the 80s that meant that he was still a class driver and on a Sunday capable of points and podiums in a decent midfield car. In 1993 for Ligier, he scored a third place podium at Imola and eventually finished seventh in the championship before what should have been a dream move to McLaren. McLaren at the point Brundle got there were in their first year with a brand new engine supplier in Peugeot. And that season is infamous with how many times the cars broke down, most notably in Silverstone where it seemed like Martin's car caught fire almost instantaneously as the lights went green. Now that actually wasn't down to the engine, it was a totally different issue altogether but Martin Brundle broken down with his McLaren either smoking or on fire. That was pretty much the image of McLaren Peugeot in 1994. That did not stop Martin Brundle, however. He would go on to notch up another two podium places, with second and third in Monaco and Australia respectively, finishing seventh again in the championship. Oh, and did I mention? His teammate was Mika Hakkinen of all people, up against the driver who would go on to win two world championships for McLaren, Martin in a mediocre McLaren did more than a respectable job. The last few seasons would see him go back to Ligier for 95, where he actually had to share his seat with Aguri Suzuki because of contractual reasons with Honda. But even as a part-time driver, Martin still managed to score a podium in the 11 races that he did with a third place at Spa. His send-off in 96 would be with Jordan. Although there was no podium, he was still a consistent point scorer. However, that season for him is best remembered for his scary and spectacular crash in the season opener in Melbourne. However, by 96, the fact that he was 37 years old meant that the team preferred to go with a cheaper and younger driver for the following season. Even though Martin was still trying to find a drive for 1997, he would hang up his suit and helmet and pick up the mic stepping straight into the commentary booth 
with Murray Walker to begin a legendary career all over again. To me in the 90s, he was always at the right place, but at the wrong time. He went to Benetton when they were good, but not quite when they had a championship level car a few years later. Then a McLaren, who won championships at the start and end of the decade, but when he was there, they were right in the middle of their mid-90s decline. What I want to end with is the story that always comes to my head when I think of Martin Brundle, and it goes back to his one season with Benetton in 1992. This is the man that Flavio Briatori says he regretted dropping at the end of 92, because he could never find anyone as good as Martin Brundle to partner Michael Schumacher ever again. I don't think that Flavio actually regretted much of anything that he did during his time in F1, so for him to come out and say that, that should tell you everything you need to know about how good Martin Brundle was in that one season in a decent car. To me at least, he will always be my greatest ever F1 driver to never win a Grand Prix.